Nowadays, the average American breath rate is 15 to 20 breaths a minute. It's about uh, 17 breaths a minute. That is freaking fast. And we have only been breathing that way in the last 20 to 30 years. The average American breath rate in 1939 was 4.9 breaths a minute. Our grandparents breathed 70 to 80% slower than we breathe today. Why is nobody talking about that? The quickest way to change your neurological state is through your breath. Fact. The quickest way to change your neurological state is through your breath. Why? The brain has the lungs on speed dial. Think about it. If your lungs stop working or there is an obstruction in the airway, the brain needs to know about it quicker than any other part of the body. So over millions of years of evolution, the brain has prioritized signals from the lungs above all other. If you were to do this and don't do this, Vishen or anyone else uh, of the couple of hundred people who are tuning in, if I were to ask you to do this for five minutes, <gasps> you would eventually go into a panic. You would actually have a panic attack. You wouldn't be able to stop it because eventually the brain would go, I'm receiving so many panic messages of respiration from the lungs, I should move into panic mode. However, if you did the opposite, and this would be a good thing to do for the next five minutes, if you went, ah, Ah, longer exhale than inhale, and also with an audible ah, you will move into relaxation response. Oh, you could yeah. be watching a horror movie, but if you are breathing in that way, the brain goes, I don't care about the horror movie. I care what the lungs are telling me. So the quickest way to change your neuro neurological state is through the breathing. It turns out, and you, Vishen, you're going to love this if you haven't see, heard this before. It turns out there is an optimal human breath rate. When I first read this, I was like, oh, fuck off. There go. We're so different people. Come on, there's not optimal human breath rate. For 90% of the world's population, there is an optimal human breath rate. It is exactly 5.1 breaths a minute, but let's call it five breaths a minute. When you breathe at five breaths a minute for at least three to four minutes, that's when it starts to click in. And you can see this on a graph. The electrical rhythms of the brain, the heart, and the lungs become synchronized. So you see it on the graph. They're all over the place. You start breathing at five breaths a minute, which is slow. I'm talking breathing in two, three, four, breathing out two, three, four, you know, way slower than usual. But if you breathe like that, I'll about three or four minutes. The electrical rhythms of the heart, brain and lungs become synchronized. Your heart rate variability becomes in perfect form. And to quote uh, uh, Dr. Richard Brown from Columbia, assistant professor of psychiatry, Everything that can be measured in the lab becomes optimized after five to 10 minutes of breathing at five breaths a minute. And the race of breathing at five breaths a minute is colloquially known as coherent breathing. Mm -hmm. Coherent breathing. Now, people might be saying, what about that other 10%? I said 90% of the world's population, the optimal breath rate is five breaths a minute. If you are well over six foot tall, you might want a slightly slower breath rate, maybe uh, four breaths a minute, 3.5. It's to do with the distance between the lungs and the extremities, actually. But for the vast majority of the human population, breathing at five breaths a minute, everything that can be measured in the lab becomes optimized. In 1939, was five breaths per minute. 939 was uh, 4.9 breaths a minute. In the 50s, in four, uh, uh, 1950, it jumps to about 5.6 breaths a minute. Even as uh, recent, as recent as the 80s, I was born in the 80s, right? 1980, the average American breath rate was 7.8 breaths a minute. What the hell has happened in the last 40 years to more than double the average breath rate? Perhaps the same thing that has doubled the rates of obesity, of heart disease, of many cancers, of, of uh, uh, dementia and Alzheimer's. Could there be a link? Almost certainly. How am I backing that up? Anytime you breathe quicker than 10 breaths a minute, you are activating the fight or flight system, which leads to the audacious claim that I'm making that the vast majority of the world's population alive today are in a constant state of fight or flight activation simply because of the way they breathe. Now, what's so bad about being in fight or flight? Well, from a psychological point, it, point of view, it means we're constantly on the lookout for a fight or a fleeing situation that never comes. But at a biological level, when you activate the fight or flight system, which is called the sympathetic nervous system, you are pushing the accelerator on the car. It's like getting us ready for action. But because there's no action to get ready for, because we're just chilling, 
but still breathing incredibly fast, it's like having the handbrake on the car at the same time as the accelerator pedal is down. Now, what does that do to the body? The first thing, it releases free radicals. We probably heard about free radicals on moisturizer adverts and stuff like that. And it's kind of right what they say it's doing. Uh, free radicals oxidize uh, the cells within our body. The second thing that happens is every time you activate the fight or flight system, cortisol is released into the bloodstream. And we know that cortisol leads to the buildup of placky acids within the arteries, which make them smaller and smaller, which can lead to heart attacks oh. and strokes. I yes. believe that the vast majority of chronic health conditions can be at least mitigated, if not some breathwork practitioners are saying cured, by breathing much, much slower than usual. If you can do five breaths a minute, go for it. But if that's too slow, then at least six or seven breaths a minute would be great. But breathing at 15 to 20 breaths a minute is way too fast. We're in a constant state of fight or flight activation. And crucially, it is screwing up our sleep. Because in order to go to sleep, you need to activate not the sympathetic nervous system, but the parasympathetic nervous system. You can be doing all of the sleep hygiene tips you like. Oh, I didn't look at my phone for an hour before bed. I didn't have coffee after lunch. I had a hot bath before I went to sleep. It doesn't matter. You can change the outer environment all you like. Until you learn to switch on the parasympathetic, the rest and digest, you'll be that staring is, until morning. That is incredible. Yeah, we are breathing incredibly fast. So right. there's something called so, chronic sympathetic activation, which is caused by the way we breathe. Okay, um, so we've got to slow down our breathing or practice, practice slow breathing for about five minutes a day. Oh, more if you can. For coherent breathing, you, you need to be doing okay. like 20 minutes a day. If you can be doing 20 minutes of coherent breathing a day, two 10-minute sessions or one 20-minute session, the impact on sleep is found within one to two days. Like very quick response. Wow. Why? The parasympathetic drive thing and also a habit of breathing slower than usual. The other thing I want to mention on breath work is nose breathing. Okay, breathing through your nose is really, really good for you. Breathing through your mouth is pretty bad for you. Really? Breathing through your nose, you've got a three layer filtration system, right? So you've got the hairs in your nose, you've got the mucous membrane, you've got cilia, which are these little microscopic hairs. They're basically filtering out debris and stuff. So that's one good thing about nose breathing. The second thing is breathing through your nose, air conditions it. The nose will either heat up or cool down the air as it enters into the lungs, making it more palatable and allowing more air to come in. So although it feels like, you know, you're doing exercise, right? You want to breathe through your mouth. Although breathing through your mouth brings in more air, it doesn't bring in more oxygen. This is very interesting point. When you breathe through your nose, nitric oxide is released into the bloodstream, not nitrous oxide. That's the kind of stuff that's laughing gas. That's what you might have alongside your marijuana spliff if you're, if you're at a party. But nitric oxide expands the blood vessels. So breathing through your nose brings in more oxygen than breathing through your mouth. Um, also, mouth breathing is there are many dentists in America who believe that mouth breathing is one of the largest causes of teeth decay on the set on a par on the same level with uh, sodas and fizzy drinks, because breathing through your mouth leads to build up of bacteria and stuff and gives you bad breath. And so one of the things in the book, and this is quite extreme, but I want to mention it because it's an interesting thing. Look into the potential of, of mouth taping when you sleep. I'm talking about a tiny strip of surgical tape down the middle line of your lips, just like that. Very easy to break. You open your mouth and it'll break to encourage nasal breathing for at least the third of your life that you're asleep. I found that when I mouth tape, I need between half an hour to 40 minutes less sleep than I usually do. So I'll wake up about 30 minutes to 40 minutes before my alarm clock. Why? Because the, the uh, quality of sleep you get when you breathe through your nose is far better because you have an oxygenated bloodstream, you're getting an, a, a correct amount of air, um, you're breathing slower, because of course you can't make these sharp, shallow breaths when you breathe through your nose, it takes a, a, you know slightly more effort to breathe through. So um, yeah, breathing through your nose is really good for you and breathing much slower than usual is really good for you.